Hello, welcome to Emerging Cricket's first ever live video show. If you are tuning in today, wherever you are around the world, you are a part of history. So congratulations for being one of the first to tune in. I'm Daniel Beswick and I'll be discussing news and other goings on in the Emerging game with all of you around the world. And I'll be joined by various guests around the traps to discuss cricket in its non-traditional centres. Make sure to follow and like Emerging Cricket across your various social media networks as well. But for now, sit back and relax as we fill you in with everything there is to know around the cricket world. Every week, I'll be joined by a special guest. And in our premiere, we've kept things pretty close to home to start things off. One of the founding fathers of the emerging cricket movement. My first guest was appointed Cricket Hong Kong's first ever CEO in April 2015 and has since become an advocate in the world of the associate game. Tim Cutler, welcome in to A Slice of History. I'm very, very happy to be here, Bez. I thought you, you might have star wiped me in, but uh, <laughs> it's good, good to be here with... Uh, hope everyone appreciates all, all the hard work that's gone behind. Look at the green screen behind me. <laughs> but, uh, no, happy to be here, mate. How are you? No, good. Excited to get this up and going. We have been talking about this idea for a couple of weeks now. We've seen everyone else jump on the bandwagon and we thought, why not give it a try as well? If you are relatively new to the emerging cricket movement and there has been 2,000 Facebook likes in the space of the last week, some truly remarkable numbers coming in. So thank you for being a part of the emerging cricket movement. We wouldn't be doing this without you. If you are relatively new to emerging cricket, we have a whole catalogue of podcasts, which we have been doing since about January last year. I think there's about 90 pieces of audio in total. So if you haven't got across them as yet, make sure you do so. But to bring Tim properly into this now, Tim got myself and Nick Skinner into a WhatsApp conversation in about October 2018 to discuss the idea of emerging cricket. Now, your bond with emerging cricket is some ways it's very different to a lot of people. In other ways, you were introduced into the emerging game, uh, I guess, in, in a rather similar way as well. You became the first ever CEO of Hong Kong cricket in April 2015. And you told us that you hadn't had too much exposure in associate cricket up until that point. What was the turning point? How, how did you get into Hong Kong cricket and, and associate cricket from there? It's one of those sort of right time, right place sort of situations. I'm not one to sort of talk about luck. You know, luck is uh, when I take a catch when I'm not quite quite looking at it or when a half tracker gets hit into the hands of the man on the fence. But I'd actually moved to, to Hong Kong working in, in marine insurance as I as I had been for, for quite a while for a Hong Kong-based broker. Started playing cricket in Hong Kong for, for Hong Kong Cricket Club and started to to get to know some of the players and people say, oh, he's a national team player, you know, we'll watch out for him, Bubba Hype, smash it, Nazakit Khan, he'll, he'll hit it further. Um, that was my welcome to Hong Kong cricket. Um, I, my first ball to Nazakit, he blocked. The next ball, he hit it over my head for uh, for six. Actually, it was more of a, a cover drive for six onto the net over the uh, the pool in, in Hong Kong. But uh, more and more, I sort of heard about these stories and they're like, that so-and-so's not here anymore, he's away with the national team and, and they were away trying to qualify for the 2014 World Cup, unbeknownst to me. I didn't know too much about associate cricket. And uh, off they went. They uh, went off to Bangladesh. And I remember watching them play up in the, the top bar of Hong Kong Cricket Club against Bangladesh and Chirigong winning that game. And I was, you know, I was basically in tears. These are the guys I play against. So I know that they you know, they don't get paid a lot to play. And here they are beating a, a cricketing nation that basically worships worships cricket. So it just happened to be that at the same time with the national team coming out, they'd just won one day into national status and a lot more funding coming that way and playing uh, World Cricket League Championship cricket as it was, ODI cricket and Intercontinental Cup first class cricket that they they needed a, a, an executive head to come in and, and run the business because it had grown so much in terms of income but also the number of players. And like I said, with my business background and my passion for the game and what I thought the game could be for Hong Kong and bringing everybody together. Um, there I was, 33 years old, the first CEO of Cricket Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong Cricket Association, which became Cricket Hong Kong. See, Hong Kong has a, a pretty unique history in the world of cricket in that it's an associate member, but we have seen plenty of tournaments going back decades in terms of the Sixers. And you brought in the Hong Kong T20 Blitz with, with a couple of other people. And I think it was actually my first interaction with you was with my day job actually trying to get some information from you out of you know the Hong Kong Blitz teams and all the respective players in that 
talk us talk to us about the creation of the blitz it was a t20 tournament and you guys were well and truly jumping on that idea of, of franchise t20 cricket in your own niche in in hong kong you were able to bring in a couple of international players from michael clark to sandeep lamachane uh we had kumar sangakara as well what was the work that went into that and and how pleasing is it to look back and see that project uh, project as a as a success very humble beginnings. Uh, Charlie Burke, who was director of cricket, well, head coach when I, when I took over it as a CEO and he became director of cricket. And, and Max Abbott, who we've spoken to on the podcast recently, um, who's the marketing uh, and media manager for the T20 World Cup now. Uh, we've got our heads together. The, a lot of the, the, the players have always got used to playing within their club teams and then they'd go off to national duty. But there's no sort of stepping stone to the, the, the higher class, higher uh, level of cricket and getting them playing together before the national team. Well, how about we we look at a non-club aligned T20 tournament and how about we even try to sell some franchises and get the public involved, get the, the corporate um, world in Hong Kong involved in cricket. So we put out um, invitations to to buy a franchise, to, to lease it, and we got some, some great owners that came in. But at the same time when this was happening, there were two other very important things happening in the background as well. Sandy Lamachani was playing uh, underage cricket in Nepal against a touring MCC team and playing against Scott McKechnie, who was a coach at Hong Kong Cricket Club at the time. Uh, Scott went on to coach one of the Blitz teams and he headhunted and recruited Sandy to come and play in the Blitz. Uh, and we also got a call. It's funny how, how these things happen. But Michael Clark, uh, his agent, called us out of the blue saying, we've heard about this tournament in Hong Kong. Michael is considering returning to playing cricket and looking at T20 as an avenue, just wondering if there's an opportunity for him to come up and play and also do some coaching and whatnot as well. And we thought, uh, uh, well, wow, this is an amazing opportunity to have one of the biggest names in world cricket. And remember, this is 2016, about a year after Australia had just won the 2015 World Cup. Um, and here was one of the biggest names of World Cricket coming to play. And so really fast forwarded a lot of the ideas we had around the tournament. We're very big on getting it streamed and getting um, the story of Hong Kong cricket and cricketers out to as many people as possible. Uh, and unfortunately, that first year was curtailed with a, a lot of rain. We, we fit in the, the games in the, the last weekend possible before they close the, the grounds down for the, uh, the off-season work. And it absolutely came down in, in buckets. But I think the seed was... Seed was sown and the Blitz came back the year after 2017, bigger and better, bigger TV audience, a great TV production, um, an ex-Fox Sports producer who had done work with the early Big Bash there to lead it and it just went from strength to strength. And I think in that second year, it was over 100 million people that watched it across the world. It, it was incredibly fun to watch and I know that that particular ground that you, that you hold the Blitz is, is a small one and you guys had a counter of all the kookaburras that you lost for the tournament, which I thought brought its own charm to not only associate cricket, but from a mass media market, the idea of having that as, as something a little bit different, almost, um, almost a bit of a, what's the word I'm trying to think of? I can't think of it right now, but we are sort of live, so I need to keep things going. <laughs> it, it was It was quite different. It brought something new to, the idea of, uh, of telecast cricket, franchise cricket, the bright colours. We saw the blue of the Kowloon Cantons as we just put up, um, the pinks and, and the reds as well. Looking back and, and talking and, and reflecting on the Cricket Hong Kong uh, stint that you had, how proud are you knowing that you you brought uh, Hong Kong cricket further along and you left it in a, in a place higher than when you first came in? Oh, very proud. I still get... Uh teary-eyed really when I see things pop up on Facebook. Funnily enough, it was today um, of those those games on that weekend in 2016. So it's it's four years to the day that the Blitz first started. Um, I think we achieved what we, we set out to do of providing a platform to create local heroes, giving our players the, the opportunity to play with and against some of the biggest stars in the world and see Michael Clark, Ian Bell, Miss Brile Huck, um, D um, Darren Sammy to come and captain one of the teams, uh, to lead one of the teams. It achieved everything we're looking at there and it's just too bad that after three editions it's had to be put on pause by Cricket Hong Kong. Um, we all know what's been going on going on in Hong Kong and also with the coronavirus uh, pandemic putting pay to that. But 
we can only hope that it comes back. You know, there's been a bit written on emergingcricket.com and various other places about whether it will come back and the place of the sixes in Hong Kong. But to, thinking back to what you were trying to grab before, I think it's the, the innovation and unique properties that, that Hong Kong has brought to sport. You know, Hong Kong sevens rugby changed the game. It's now an Olympic version of sport that really was popularised and turned into an entertainment product in, in, in Hong Kong. And I think cricket had done the same with the sixes, not quite as realised uh, as it could have been potentially before the rise of T20. They were playing sixes in, in Hong Kong for a decade before. But that's what we try to do with the, the T20. But it's a small ground. We, we played with what we had. We had a small ground. We packed it full. We made tickets affordable to fill the ground out. Um, and with the Kookaburra idea as well, we actually had to use another you know, Kookaburra turf balls that you see used on, on TV are about 140 Australian dollars a pop. And then there's the Kookaburra regulation, still four pieces, but just not the top grade willow, uh, sorry, top grade leather. <laughs> and we actually used those ones. So I think some of the bowlers were really happy to get the, to get those in their hands because they hadn't bowled with one since grade cricket saying, wow, I love it because the seam's a little bit more prominent yeah. and just a little bit more for the bowlers. So I think watching it was almost like we created a, a condensed version of the sport on this small ground, crowd close. I think it took a lot of players back to their roots when you know there, all these players were very used to playing on TV, big grounds, crowd a long way away from the play. But to see kids up there near the fence asking for autographs, I think it was just a great experience and really brought the, the Hong Kong community together in cricket and really brought some great owners and investors out of the crowd as well that may not have been interested in sponsoring the game, but the fact that they could own a team and be part of it and drive it uh, forward from a team culture, a brand, a colours and, and, and whatnot saw are really starting something special. And then to see some of the teams go on, one of the team owners went on to buy franchises in the T20 Global League in South Africa, which, of course, didn't happen. But they're the, the owners of the St Kitts and Nevis Patriots in the in the Caribbean Premier League now. So to see those sort of entrepreneurs start their time in Hong Kong, but then also see the owners of Islamabad United who are actually based in Hong Kong, get a team going as well, Hong Kong Island United that Ian Bell and Miss Burrell played for. So it was great to be the, the centre of the cricketing universe and to have something that was over in five days as well that kept people's attention. It's an interesting idea, isn't it, that not only are tournaments like this a good feeder and a good taste for some young players coming through, but also the people involved in coaching, even in umpiring, but also in administration and, and, and ownership, able to get a little bit of experience and maybe the consequences and the fluctuations aren't as heavy as if they were to own, say, a CPL franchise or an IPL fr franchise. But for them to have that entrepreneurial experience in a smaller boutique tournament, it, it could, you know, develop their game in, in their own careers and that even though it's off the field, you know, there's still development there. Oh, absolutely. It was a proving ground for players and administrators and, and owners alike. I think you just encapsulated there perfectly. Uh, and it was a low risk entry. I, um, the, the teams originally to buy were around 10,000 US dollars. Um, Cricket Hong Kong provided everything in the tournament for the broadcast and seating and boxes for the, the teams. And basically it was up to the team to, to get their overseas players by private agreement, uniforms, transport and whatnot, and get them to the ground. So it's quite a a really a, a partnership between those owners and Cricket Hong Kong. And really, we were, we were so much learning as we go, but no one had really done it the way that we, we'd done it in an associate. We were the first um, country outside, first team outside of a full member to have a, a franchise a competition like that with that many overseas players. Uh, and I think a lot of countries have come and, and gone since trying to replicate it, but maybe have gone too big too early. We've seen the, the struggles with the Caribbean Premier League um, in, in getting teams and players paid and also the, the, the Canada T20 and also the Euro T20 Slam. So I'm not saying that the model doesn't work, um, but I think sometimes you can probably shoot too high. And like UAE T20X as well, really high dreams, potential uh, salaries of 400 or 300,000 US dollars for, for players like Owen Morgan or whatnot. But, but couldn't attract enough interest. So I think we really created something there that was really low risk, as you say, for people to get an entry in the market. There have been a couple of comments that have come in and we'll get to those in a second. So make sure if you do have any questions for us, make sure to do so. I wanted to bring up that idea of, of potentially, you know, having two loftier dreams, but it seems at this stage that Olympic aspirations, and you brought up that up a little bit earlier, discussing the idea of funding for a nation like Hong Kong and how important and how vital funding can be for a country like Hong Kong, you know, if an Olympics was to include cricket as a sport. 
we talk to uh, Brian Mantle, who will actually be on our podcast tomorrow about German cricket and the idea of how Olympic cricket will really help them and their funding. We've seen Russia just recognise cricket as a sport. Can you viably see a 2028 LA Olympics with cricket included? That's the first question. And the second question is, how vital is that? How much can cricket explode off the back of Olympic participation? Well, absolutely. Um, yeah, there have been a few uh, road bumps in the way trying to, to get cricket to be considered for Olympic inclusion, but also get cricket to agree to be uh, included in the Olympics and how it would, would be. Can I see a 2020 Olympics? Absolutely. The idealist in me and the passionate person wants to see cricket grow as much as it can. It, it, it's there and there are facilities there that can be adapted for that. Now, people talk about cricket in the Olympics and say, well, it's only going to be an eight or ten team competition for, for men and women. What's the point? How is that going to grow the game? But it goes so much broader than that. When we're not even talking about how teams would qualify and whether they come in via regionally and the fact that the West Indies would be broken up into their sovereign nations and whatnot. But Olympic inclusion and experience in Hong Kong showed me this and also talking to a lot of other cricketing nations that there are a lot of governments there that really only care about Olympic sports and only really invest in um, Olympic uh, participation and, and sometimes they're only after medals or sometimes they're just looking for, for Olympic participation. And the likes of China, uh, America, Russia, Brazil, Germany, Japan, all these powers in terms of global sport but also investment and GDP are countries that invest in, in Olympic sports. So what it would mean for the likes of, of Hong Kong or, or China, we're talking about tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars of extra funding as soon as the game gets into the Olympics. And that funds not only um, athletes and, and their wages, but also gives the sport access to the high performance training facilities that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And in some countries, it's actually recognised as a sport and, and brought into national federations that are only allowed there for, for Olympic sport. So it's not just making it to the end and, and being on that dais with with, with an Olympic medal. It, it, it's the, the road that would lead up to it and also the, the additional promotion that would come from it being Olympic sport. Yeah, it's an interesting topic. And, and while I think we're all overwhelmingly positive about the idea of having cricket as an Olympic sport, it's one of those things where there have been a lot of hurdles along the way. Uh, India has been a big hurdle in that where the BCCI and in India weren't uh, WADA compliant, which made things increasingly difficult. But it seems as if that roadblock has been shifted. Well, to, to many people, they believe that hurdle has been um, mm. overcome. So we might see the possibility of cricket in the Olympics at some point. But again, you know, there are a lot of other things that need to be sorted out. And, and talking about the Olympics and, you know, I think China is almost synonymous with Olympic sports. And whilst I don't want to get into too many political discussions with you about Hong Kong and, and China and the whole situation there, um, it could be the great it's almost a final frontier having China involved in world cricket. And of course they are involved in world cricket. We have covered them in uh, tournaments gone past their women's team, uh, fractionally stronger than their men's team. And they do compete in respective Asian tournaments, but to bring it back to, to Hong Kong. And I know you've been out of the, the Hong Kong uh, fraternity for a little while now. So you actually have a pretty good perspective of this as someone on the outside looking in. We've had a comment come in from Leonesh Pandey. First of all, thank you for your question. He asks, will Hong Kong recover from the Barber, Hyatt and Anshman Rath situation anytime soon? Now, two very different situations here. Uh, we've had Anshi Rath pursuing an Indian dream by going back uh, to his parents' uh, roots and trying to make a career from cricket through the Indian system. Uh, Barber Hyatt and a number of other Hong Kong players have found themselves uh, in a little bit of hot water in regards to a couple of things which I don't really want to get into, but there is a lot of depth coming through in Hong Kong cricket. We saw it at the qualifier, the ICC T20 World Cup qualifier. You were there in person to watch on and to see some of the young talent coming through, the Nasrallah Ranas and so on. How did Hong Kong come back from that situation? Because they lost, well, it was almost a whole team of players in the last sort of 12 to 18 months. How did they come back from that? 
that's a good question, and uh, it's great to get the live comments there as we go and sort of throw our questioning a little bit, a little bit off the uh, off the track. Uh, you mentioned China, uh, Hong Kong. Uh, I'll just a little comment about China and, and, and the Olympics have been the final frontier. To put it in perspective, um, when rugby sevens was made an Olympic sport, uh, Ali Sports, the side of um, Ali Pay uh, and, and whatnot up there in in, in China, uh, found a, a corporate investment deal where they would be putting 10 million US dollars a year over 10 years to invest in Chinese rugby to try and get it up to the standard of competing in the Olympics. So that's that's $100 million that didn't need to come from the ICC and didn't come from, from corporate sponsors whatsoever. And whilst that deal uh, has seen a few road bumps and I think Hong Kong rugby were actually involved with that somewhat, it just shows the commitment that China and the Chinese corporate market as well has the Olympic Games. So the Hong Kong question, yeah, it's been really tough to, to watch, you know, you mentioned we were there both in Namibia when they dropped back out of uh, ODI status and out of the top uh, echelon of, of associate one day cricket, but also to be there as a T20 World Cup qualifier, supposedly as an impartial observer in the in the press box to watch that that last game against Oman and, and to have Oman in trouble at five down for around 20 and then to see uh, amazing innings to, 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 to get them back um, for Oman and then some some great bowling from Bilal Khan swinging it around corners to uh, be knocking stumps and legs everywhere. Um, how do they come back? They they get a good strong coach like they have in Trent Johnston that really sets the bar high in terms of integrity and and commitment levels. Um, associate cricket is, is not easy at the best of times. You got players everywhere in the world potentially away at school uh, trying to manage training while people are, are working, but to have a coach that sets the standards and players that, that go with it and we're already seeing them with the, the names that you mentioned some young fast bowlers some young spinners and some i think the key for hong kong is to, to nurture some some young batters uh, that need to come through and follow in the footsteps of chapman rath baba hyatt um to, and, and jamie atkinson who's still around but not able to play as much because his full-time role as a teacher it's a tough one in hong kong because it's such a small pool of players it was always i think people would always look at hong kong and think how have you guys done so well you've got 400 senior players and yet you're going to beat Bangladesh and one win away from the 2015 World Cup. I think there was a great talent pool there, but the advantage you have in Hong Kong that everyone's close and everyone can train together a, a lot more, where if you look at the likes of Canada that may have a lot more players, you need to spend a lot more money in getting everybody to the same place at the same time to train. So you're able to have that intensive training as, as necessary and, geez, there's a lot of talent in that in that squad. How they come back to it, back from it, they maintain that those levels of, of discipline, and if the likes of Baba Hyatt um, and and whatnot want to come back into the fold, that, that, then great. But you really got to start those grassroots on the way up. And we've got some really, oh, I'm say, still saying we, aren't I? I can't, I can't, can't lose that one. Some no. great talent coming through the under 19s, and so there's a few players to watch that are overseas at school as well that were born in in, in Hong Kong uh, and are and going to school in New Zealand at the moment. Um, Callan Mark uh, Chalal is one, a little right-hander. I say little, but he's so is uh, Sachin Tendulkar, who has a lot of talent. And I think it's just going to be a matter of time, a matter of if rather than when we start to see the Kapoors and Chalals in, in the, the first team, but not to rush them. But there's a lot of talent. It's just how you manage it and how you hold on to them. You know, Anshu Rath is now in India, but born and bred in Hong Kong, Hong Kong player, such a talent. Mark Chapman, born and bred in Hong Kong, but now playing in the New Zealand system and for New Zealand. Yeah, Mark Chapman uh, was brought in uh, just recently in the, in some of the only cricket that was played before coronavirus. He was actually picked as a bowler, I think, because Mitchell Santner was ill and he was a number eight who I don't think actually bowled in the game, but he's a more than capable batsman. And when we actually spoke to him on the Emerging Cricket Podcast, going back a few months now, he'd come off a load of runs against uh, touring India A side for New Zealand Day when, when they came out and toured. So... I think between him, Anshu, Anshu Rath and, and Baba Hayat, there's a formula there for young Hong Kong players that should know that there is a conveyor belt of talent available and they are able to jump on that conveyor belt of talent and, and to pick the brains of the likes of, of the Johnstons and others around. Because we've seen, as you said, only 400 players, but to be able to produce 11 players at international level that compete on the world stage is is admirable you know we look at bermuda as well where there's only something like a hundred thousand people population 
uh, on the island of Bermuda and they're putting out a, a competitive international cricket team too, which qualified for a 2007 World Cup. So as, certainly... Yeah, I was going to say, as we, as, as, we, as we know, it's only 65,000 as well, so it's even better in a country that's yeah. taken over by the yeah. game. The only country in the world that has two public holidays in a, yeah. um, for, for a cricket match. Isn't this the greatest country on earth? I got, I got my Jersey and Bermuda numbers mixed up. But Jersey, again, is another example, 100,000 people and still competing and competing at a high level, also competing in the uh, EC World Cup of Jerseys, which we have got going at Emerging Cricket at the moment. So make sure to vote for your favourite. We're into the quarterfinal stage. Uh, but to bring this back and to, to wrap the Hong Kong chat up and to talk about Emerging Cricket from a more holistic standpoint now, because you are, you know, the, one of the founding fathers, if not the founding father of emerging cricket and away from Hong Kong. It made me feel more like Abraham Lincoln. Every I feel like with the beard, yeah, I should sorry. be. <laughs> well, you've got it groomed quite well, well Timothy. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you that. There's no chance I'm ever <laughs> rustling something like that. You, you never know. Once you're old and decrepit like me, you'll, you, you never know. You get the grey bits as well. It makes you look a lot more, a lot more distinguished. But to look at, at some of the news stories that we do have for this week, the T20, uh, the T20, the T10 Vanuatu blast resumes this weekend. Uh, we've been in close contact with people involved in Vanuatu cricket. They've been really pleased with the product they've been able to put out. And I think everyone around the world has been pleased with the product they've been able to watch via the stream. I know that they've had a little bit of technical difficulty, I think, with the number of people who have uh, driven themselves uh, virtually to, to watch the game via the streams uh, on YouTube or around the place. We come into the third uh, match day of the tournament. Uh, your Afira Sharks, we did a draw, <laughs> and, and you drew out the Afira Sharks, which was... I, I, I drew out my Afira Sharks, the, yes. The Cronulla Sharks. Yeah. They've got the double dip this weekend, so they get to play two T10 matches. They play the Melee Bulls and the Mighty, Mighty Afate Panthers. The Afate Panthers have taken an early lead in it. We're about halfway through the group stage at the moment, and, yeah, you've got a 66% chance of making the final. The Afate Panthers have taken the early lead. So it's early days, but it looks like between your Sharks and my Bulls, we're fighting it out for the last final spot. Oh, how exciting it's been. And for those people watching this that don't know, you know, Vanuatu, despite them being hit by a cyclone, have not been affected by coronavirus at all with no cases in the country. And they've taken advantage of this and getting cricket up and running. And as soon as they started playing um, the women's, I think it was a 40 over final, wasn't it? They had almost half a million people watch the stream. So quick smart, they thought, well, how can we, we take advantage of this and put together a, a T10 Super League with the best players in Vanuatu? Of course, the Vanuatu men's team is in the, the Challenge League, which is the, the List A 50 over tournament that sits below the ODI Cricket World Cup Super League. Uh, and below the uh, Cricket World Cup League 2. And they have a sponsor called uh, Bet Barter, uh, one of the online um, gambling firms and, and organised through one of the, the companies who have organised other T20 leagues around the world. And, and here it is being streamed around the world. Um, see the signs everywhere. Not many people watching. I would have thought they might have got a few more people, but I think it's been made up with the number of people that have been watching the stream. And, gee, there's some talent in those players, aren't, isn't there? Well, that last game of the second day was excellent. 130 runs between them, 260 runs in under 20 overs. Uh, an electric finish and Macmillan Markiel almost pulling off one of the best pieces of fielding I've seen at any level of cricket. And that finish to a game was befitting of any level of cricket as well. So we can't underestimate just how good uh, any live cricket is to watch, but to have a thrilling final like that and as you said ra rather pretty much unaffected by COVID-19 and yeah fighting through a, a cyclone a, a little bit earlier on to, to get the tournament up and running is fantastic. Uh, another T10 tournament which we will see in a couple of weeks uh, is in the Czech Republic. Now in terms of Europe the Czech Republic have been uh, not COVID free like Vanuatu but they've been one of the the better copers of the pandemic. Uh, we'll talk to Chris Pearce in a couple of weeks to discuss the tournament, but it's being run through the European Cricket Network as part of the European Cricket Series. So a shout out to all those guys, Daniel Weston and, and everyone out there doing their job in European cricket and, and getting that up and running, which is great to see. Again, we'll have Chris on the show and he's been a, a big advocate of emerging cricket in our movement, but to see live cricket now moving to Europe and, and then being able to put on a tournament 
in the midst of this pandemic, that is rather encouraging and hopefully other European countries will be able to follow suit. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, cricket's got a real opportunity here, especially in countries where it may not have such a commercial foothold, but where those more popular sports are really going to be struggling with a lack of sponsors and the lack of money coming in to sustain it, where the grassroots nature of, of cricket in a lot of these countries may mean it, it can actually spread more beyond the community or beyond the, its existing community because they don't have uh, that many overheads to be able to grow. So it really is a great opportunity here for cricket, as we're seeing, get up and running again. Uh, a lot less contact than many other sports, probably almost no contact, and um, maybe unless you're a Merv Hughes type fast bowler up in the grill of the, of the batter. But it's, it's just interesting to see the countries that have, have, have popped up Vanuatu, Taipei. You know, we haven't talked about yet a T10 competition, uh, the Czech Republic, I think even Burundi, not even a, an ICC member either, similar to Taipei, have been playing and trying to, um, to broadcast their game. So it's great to see cricket I think from a, an administrator point of view and a, a guy passionate about the, wanting the game to grow I just hope these countries are able to to take advantage of this as much as possible and have those clips ready to go as marketing down the line because all these countries will all be run by volunteers or maybe have one or two paid staff members not marketing gurus that are there putting digital packages together so I just hope part of these deals they're going to have lots of Lots of great vision to use in their marketing material from now on. But uh, as you said, it's just great to see some live sport and especially cricket in the emerging cricket world. Yeah, as I said, we'll have Chris Pierce on the podcast uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Make sure to follow and uh, like and make sure you're keeping up to date with that podcast every week. As I said, we have Brian Mantle tomorrow. Uh, we also had a two-part special with PNG hard-hitting bowling all around and Norman Fanur, which was excellent listening and and i just hope you know i'm sure you feel the same tim but i just hope that the emotions that he had in in talking about emerging emerging cricket come across to to everyone listening at home we've run out of time here timothy we were promising to keep this within half an hour we've gone over already uh thank you very much i'm about that much surprised yeah yeah, exactly (laughs) look thank you so much for joining me as well the first guest and i say that in inverted commas because (laughs) realistically you're more of a co-host but thank you tim but it is still my pleasure even even as a even as a guest but hopefully it's the first of many look it's a great opportunity to to get out there and as everybody's been commenting and as we will be in other live shows get involved and share as much as you can with you know emerging cricket is run 100 percent by volunteers and all the funds that come in via Patreon that will support us to be able to grow. And it's all about shining a light on the stories around the world. So we really love the support that's coming in. Um, and like I said, get involved with these live videos when they're up. Who knows how often, once a week, twice a week, it's how often Bez is able to do it. <laughs> yeah. And, no uh, pressure. Yeah, well, at the moment, uh, given my unemployment, uh, this seems to have taken the vast majority of my time. Once again, thank you very much, Tim. It's Kate Bolt with news and events from Cricket's New World. Make sure to follow Emerging Cricket on Twitter and Facebook as well as Instagram. And again, make sure you are keeping up to date with our podcast each and every week. But for now, enjoy the rest of your day wherever you are around the Emerging Cricket world.